I'm going to talk a little bit about the way we things now, the way we see things now, before I go back into the past. So I want to give a setting of what what we roughly of what we currently believe. So what is the Higgs boson? Okay, you all know that the world around us consists of atoms. There are many types of atoms, and we have a way of explaining this. We explain them in terms of a periodic table, and we know that the nuclei of these atoms are made out of protons and neutrons. We know why there are protons and neutrons, and in fact now, starting around the 1950s, but somewhat before that, but starting at the ninth, around the 1950s, an alphabet soup, that is, you pick a letter, we'll give you a particle that is designated by that letter, and you can have it. Now? Yeah. Okay. All right, you pick, pick a letter, preferably in the Greek alphabet, uh, and we'll probably have a particle that is named after that letter. And in fact, during that time in the 50s and the 60s, you could almost every day learn of a new particle, even sometimes in the New York Times before it hit the learned journals. And so there was an explosion of these things, and it was very confusing because we thought the world was very simple. And we not, but and originally we thought there were just protons and protons and electrons, protons and neutrons, and then we found this alphabet soup. But we understand these now in terms of simpler objects called quarks. And we realize that the proton and the neutron, in fact, are composed out of three smaller objects, which can't be separated out. You can't observe these things in a, a isolated, far away from other matter, but there's no doubt that there's there. You can tell from other probes. Now, th these quarks are colored in this picture, and it turns out there's a reason for that, and there's lots of technicalities of the theory, which, of course, I can't go into here. You wouldn't want me to, even if I did. All right, but I'm t there is more than I'm telling you. I'm just giving you sort of the outer layer. All right. We now know for sure that there are six quarks. There is some suspicion, and good reason for that suspicion, I think, that there are more. But so far, we haven't seen them. We also know there are six particles that are called leptons. You're all familiar with one of the leptons, the electron. But it has five other friends that are similar in some ways in their behavior to, to the electron, although very different in detail. And we also know that the quarks, and, and in particular the, the composites of the quarks, and the leptons interact with forces which are carried by particles. The particle that you are most familiar with is currently bombarding you. It is a particle of light called the photon, or designated here by the gamma. These are called so-called gauge bosons, and they are responsible for all these interactions, that, uh, the interactions of light with matter, and also a class of interactions called weak interactions. There are also strong interactions, and I'll just not even go into those here, but of course they're incredibly important. And in fact, uh, another very important interaction, which I won't go into, is one that you're most familiar with, which is gravity. And that's a whole other story in itself. So with these building blocks, it is possible to construct a model of matter that can explain what we observe. Uh, uh, in fact, if you put in the, the the strong interactions that could explain everything we observe. Uh, but this model requires 
that these particles are massless in order for it to make any sense. Now, this isn't a great problem for the electromagnetic force. The electron, uh, the neutrino, the muon, uh, the up and down quarks, the things that go into the neutron and photon, and the photon are pretty light by the standards that we measure mass or weight by. On the other hand, this is a big problem for other things associated with the weak force. The weak, the weak force is a force that, for example, explains why the sun works. If the sun doesn't work, we're in trouble, and I wouldn't be giving this talk. So, in fact, the, the W and Z bosons I mentioned on the previous slide, which are associated with the weak source, are roughly 150,000 times the mass of an electron. It's very hard to say that's zero. It's not a good approximation. So we can't, we, we have a problem. The, the simple model we could make with everything massless is just not going to work. So in 1964, Dick Hagen, Tom Kibble, and I, as well as Higgs, and Englert and Brout had an idea. And I put Englert and Brout in small letters because although they had the idea, they actually didn't talk about the boson explicitly that I'm going to talk about. And the idea was that you add another particle to this very simplified theory that I outlined for you. Okay. We predicted that this other particle would interact uh, with the other particles and that the stronger the interaction between, between this particle and the other particles, the larger the mass that these particles would have. Now, of course, what we did was something that was much simpler than this. The model was not as developed as I've just described it, but what we did was develop a simple theory which enabled the model that I'm now talking about and which is currently used to describe physics. That particle is now called the Higgs boson. In private, you can ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, having made this model, and we didn't make this whole model, this, this, we just did the first steps of it. The whole model, I'll talk more about the making of this model. There was a question, of course, is if there is such a boson. Does it really exist? This confirmation that this existed was why there was a 50 year, well, maybe more like a 40 year search. It took 10 years or so before people believed that any of these ideas weren't absolute nonsense. Okay, so that it was so hard to find this particle uh, is why, again, this big accelerator was built. Now, to give most of the story, I start at the part which I was most involved in, which was 50 years ago. Okay, I better start this with an explanation of what my job is, what I do as a theoretical physicist. Okay. As a theoretical physicist, it is my job to find equations that predict or describe experimental results. It's better if you can predict them, but certainly good if you can describe them. <laughs> the, the, the most successful method to date used in describing particle physics is by observing, noting that all this alphabet soup of particles we found, that you can organize them, that there's a certain symmetry amongst many of these particles, and that you can put the symmetry into equations that you have to guess to describe the interactions. Now there are various rules about where you start, but in the end it involves a lot of guessing and a lot of luck and a lot of calculations, and then you're wrong 99% of the time, if you're lucky. Okay. Now there's a tool that's used for this. It's quantum mechanics, but it's sort of an enhanced quantum mechanics. Uh, and that, that kind of quantum mechanics is called quantum field theory. It is the quantum theory not of isolated particles in the sense that has meaning in quantum mechanics, but the quantum mechanics 
associated with every point in space. Now, to work this out, as you might guess, is very hard because there are lots of points in space for any given time. It's a complicated thing. We understand a theory called electromagnetism at a classical level. You all know about optics, which is producing this picture. We understand a lot about electromagnetism, and it turns out we now understand it quantum mechanically. Uh, to understand it quantum mechanically was really hard because people took the equations that were used to describe the non-quantum mechanical situation, which people knew worked for optics and various situations, and they tried to apply the rules that exist for turning something into quantum mechanics. And they did some calculations, and the first calculations they looked pretty good, were pretty good, but they, the answers were not in general accurate enough to be that useful. In fact, after World War II, with mu new microwave techniques that came out of the developments of World War II, people could start studying atomic structure very carefully, and they found out that that atomic structure was very different from that which one had predicted using simple quantum mechanical uh, uh, methods, and there was something more that we didn't understand, and they tried to understand it by using this extended quantum mechanics, and they calculated, and guess what they got every time they tried to do a calculation? Infinity. <laughs> Infinity is not a good number when you do an experiment and you find that it's a measurable number. So there was something very wrong, and it took quite a while to figure out how to handle that, and some very sophisticated work by, by Schwinger and, and Feynman and Tominaga in particular. There are also others involved, uh, in, in, partic in particular Beta and also Freeman Dyson, but many others. And they were eventually organized this theory and got wonderful results to describe the interaction of photons with electrons and protons and they could you could describe a lot of, about the details of, of energy levels in atomic systems with this. So when people started finding this alphabet soup of particles, what do you do? Well, you know, we don't have very many tricks. So you take the one that you know, this idea of quantized fields, and you try to apply it to these other situations. And you say, gee, it's got to work because we now know how to handle infinities. And the first thing, uh, well, there were various things that were done, but one of the things that was done was try to understand the weak interactions, the things that power the sun, and they calculated with them, and guess what? They got good first order results, and they calculated again, and not surprisingly, they got infinity. So they tried correcting it. And then they tried to calculate a little bit more, and they got more infinities. And every time you calculated a correction, you got more infinities that you didn't know what to do with. So this, origin, this scheme failed. It worked great for electromagnetism, but it failed for describing how the sun behaved. And what is more, when you try to understand what happened in collisions between protons, for example, at very high energies, which it turned out it involved very strong interactions, and the methods that have been developed, have been developed for electromagnetism involve very weak interactions, and of course, they didn't work. And people were very discouraged, and they ran off and moped, and they did other brilliant things and tried to develop another theory. And the ideas of quantum field theory were all but abandoned. And they survived at a few places. They survived, the ideas survived at Harvard, Imperial College in London, and the University of Chicago. And at the University of Chicago, a man by the nam name of Nambu with uh, uh, another fellow by the name of Yona Licinio had a brilliant idea about a new way to calculate. They looked at the same equations, but they discovered they could write down different solutions to the new equations, now, or to the same old equations. Now, these new solutions were, were 
rather strange to say the least, because I mentioned before that we're simplifying this mess by appealing to symmetry. You know, and you know, symmetry is very powerful. Uh, a very simple example is, you know, most people are fortunate enough to be mostly symmetry about an axis to their center. So if someone shows you half a picture of someone, you can make a pretty good guess by re uh, reflecting it about what the whole person looks like. That's an example of what's called a discrete symmetry, and it's very powerful. Uh, there are things called continuous symmetries, like things that you see when you look at a circle, where it is a, a circle, every point is essentially equivalent, and those are called continuous symmetries. But in any event, Nambu and Yano Lucinio took equations that were symmetrical, but found out that there were solutions that didn't have that symmetry. That was a big surprise, but uh, people sort of accepted that. Those solutions are called spontaneous symmetry-breaking solutions of the equations. Now, oops. Now, that was great, but the problem was is you paid a price for that. No good idea comes without a catch. And the catch was is that every time you tried to do, uh, took a set of equations and tried to do a calculation with these equations that started out being symmetrical and said, let's look for solutions that aren't symmetrical, the only way you could do that was to find a, uh, associated with those solutions, a particle with zero mass. That's a huge problem because, for example, right now we, there has only been one zero mass particle experimentally observed for certain, the photon. The photon, the thing I keep mentioning, having to do with the elect uh, electricity. So the question immediately was, hey, great idea, great solution, but are these ideas, these new solutions, anything but mathematics, are they worthless? Is just this another dead end in physics? Very recently, I heard a talk by Steven Weinberg, who summed things up very well. He pointed out something that, was things that we're all aware of, but he said it very well, uh, that the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking is a platonic idea. You start out with beautiful equations with all sorts of symmetry, but then you go to the real world to find the solutions of those equations, and you find those are solutions that not, are not as ideal, that do not have that symmetry. There are conditions opposed on them because they're required to have symmetry, one of them seemingly this massless particle. So this was a beautiful idea in many ways. But then he went on to say, that when we realized that there was always a zero mass particle associated with symmetry breaking, it, the, it was, uh, the way we felt was probably the way a small child felt when he found a hidden cupboard filled with uh, jars of jam, which were presumably delicious, and then someone told him they were poisoned. Beautiful theory, very elegant in many ways, and it didn't seem to be worthless. Okay, this is sort of where I came in. My thesis, thought, 50 years ago, my thesis advisor, actually more than 50 years ago, my thesis a little more, my thesis advisor at Harvard, his name is Wally Gilbert, he got a Nobel Prize in chemistry, told me to study the Nambu papers and see what, he could, what I could do with them. Well, of course, I had no choice but to obey. I really wanted to get a degree, even though at that time I was very skeptical about it being worthwhile. There's a picture of, of Wally uh, a long time ago. Now, the question that, in particular, that we studied was, well, we do have this one zero mass particle, which is a photon. Could that photon, that one particle that we have, somehow or other, be associated with the theorem for symmetry breaking. Maybe, maybe there was some way to put them together, at least then this, uh, these ideas would be good, good for something. But that certainly did not ap appear to be true in the normal equations we wrote down. I showed that the answer was yes. There were an entirely different set of equations 
which could describe everything we knew about quantized electromagnetism. And this was pretty astonishing. Now, this was enough for a better than decent thesis. But I was young, uh, very skeptical about all this, even though I was doing it. And I wanted more. I wasn't happy. Okay. So I thought, gee, why should we have to go to this complicated, different theory? Why doesn't the usual theory of electromagnetism, the one we always write down, have a requirement that the photon is massless? I mean, we, everywhere we, we measure it, it has no mass. It's very important. It should be built into the theory, right? You don't want to write down a theory that doesn't describe a fundamental aspect of the theory. Then it, then it doesn't make a lot of sense, seemingly. And so, and this was asked very slightly after a very famous physicist at Harvard, the guy who described the infinities, Julian Schwinger, had written a series of papers in which he argued there was absolutely no reason for the usual theory of electromagnetism to have a massless particle, except that all the couplings were very weak, so it worked out that way. And I thought, well, maybe, but that's very unsatisfying. I, in fact, I thought he was plain wrong big mistake, but it turned out to be useful. Uh, so I worked diligently, and I used this theorem from the, that Nambu, the associated with Nambu and also Goldstone, showing that if you have a spontaneously broken symmetry, uh, you must have a zero mass particle. And I used this theorem to prove the real photon was massless. Okay. Gilbert looked at, and I wrote a chapter in my thesis. Gilbert looked at this and said, oh, I don't know, uh, but okay, leave it in. And I went to my thesis exam at Harvard, and there was a man sitting on the exam who was a young assistant professor, a good friend of mine. And I thought, great, I've got it made. Uh, now, this guy already had a reputation as uh, an assassin of bad physics ideas. He had a brilliant mind. A rapid tongue, uh, and uh, he looked at he looked at the thesis. I'm sure for the first time during the exam, and he said, oh, "I don't know. This just doesn't seem right." It was a big argument. I'm sort of standing, cowering in the corner. Faculty is arguing about whether it can be right or not. Finally, they decided it must be wrong. No one knew exactly why it was wrong, but it just didn't seem right. And uh, I had to take the chapter out of my thesis. Well, I was very lucky. They could have failed me, and they didn't. So they let me get through. And I, unfortunately, you know, this was well before the age of cell phone cameras. And so I don't have a picture, you know, what I felt like taking it after the exam. But this is what Sidney Coleman, looked, who was correct, by the way, looked like after <laughs> the exam. I was just taken quite a bit later. At the time he was, of my exam, he was wearing a purple velvet suit. Uh, now, while I'm showing some pictures, I should mention that at that time, I and my friends uh, were very interested in auto mechanics. Uh, it was our hobby. We worked very hard, not only at physics, but at auto mechanics. And here's a picture. Now, this is sort of a physics picture because that building in the background is part of the Cambridge Electron Accelerator, which was being built at the time. And the man making, I hope, a friendly signal, and I don't know to this day, is, is now Baron May of Oxford. He is very famous for a lot of things, but particularly for work he's done in population biology. I'm sitting in the driver's seat. The owner took the picture. And looking very indifferent to all this is Carl Richard Hagen. Doesn't care, it looks like, right? Well, we're wrong. It turns out he cared very much because as soon as he finished his PhD thesis at MIT, oh, I should mention, Carl Dick and I worked, knew each other from the time we were undergraduates, did our first paper together, worked, did physics together all the time. We're, we were and are very good friends. And as soon as he graduated from MIT and got a postdoctoral job, at the University of Rochester, and he's still there, uh, went out and bought this. <laughs> E-type Jaguar. It costs more 
than his first year salary at the University of Rochester. He didn't eat very well for a long time. And I thought he had gone very bad and that he was going to become an experimentalist because this was, beautiful as it is, this is the most unreliable piece of machinery you can imagine. All right. Anyway, I finished off and I went to Imperial College and uh, where I had a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship, which was fantastic. It paid me $5,000 a year. And that was a lot of money then, particularly if you spent it in Europe. And, and uh, uh, I, Imperial College was probably the most exciting place in the world at the time. Harvard was for a theoretical physicists, a high energy theoretical physicists. Harvard was very good, and Imperial was better. People from all over all stopped in London. This was a time of swinging London. Now, London was a very exciting city then. And every physicist that could travel all stopped by at Imperial College, which had a lot of money for visitors, which, by the way, was provided for by the US Air Force. They actually had a contract with the US Air Force that paid for visitors and a lot of other things associated with the work they did. And there I met this very serious looking fellow there, Abdus Salam. He looks very tough and very professional. He was the friendliest, nicest, smartest man. He had a thousand ideas a day. And once every year, he had a really good idea. <laughs> but he inspired a lot of people. Don't get me wrong, he was, he was amazing. And, and just a really, really nice person. Okay, in fact, in 1979, he shared the Nobel Prize with Glashow and Weinberg for developing the unified electroweak theory, which was based on the discovery I'm about to tell you about. Okay, also there I should mention uh, that Salam was my thesis advisor, thesis advisor. So he referred to me as his grand student. And uh, 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 he, I should also mention that Weinberg was another frequent visitor to Imperial College. So having come to uh, Imperial College, I still wasn't convinced that I was entirely wrong about my idea that normal electromagnetism had a reason more than just an accident having to do with how strong its coupling was. It had a, there was a reason why the photon was massless and that I had probably just made a silly mistake. Okay, so being young, having made a really stupid mistake, that certainly did not deter me. And I went on and I managed to prove a different and seemingly brilliant theorem showing that the photon was massless. Well, it was a very powerful theorem, and I quickly wrote up a paper didn't talk to anyone about it, because I knew no one would believe anything about this anyway. And I sent it off to what was a premier physics journal, Physics Web Letters, for consideration for publication. I wrote that in the beginning of April 1964. Okay. A few days after this paper was sent, I was thinking about it, and I discovered that there was something really weird about the mathematics, and that indeed I had made an error, a very subtle error, and that subtle error only affected one very special case. Guess what? That one very special case was a case that was relevant to the theory of electromagnetism. So the paper was wrong yet again. There, were a lot of, there was a lot in that paper that was right, and it's still uh, used for other reasons, and uh, I, I figured I was very upset about it. But I figured it'd come come back. Either the referee would refuse it, or it would come back to be proofread, as they always did then through the mail. And the mail and everything was horrendously slow. The mail strikes took forever for anything to go through. Also turned out that when you gave something to the secretary to mail it, she didn't like to walk to the post office, so she was sticking the stuff in her desk. And if she got around to it. A month or so later, she might mail it. No one realized that until later. But that did cause a bit of a problem. 
But anyway, because of a series of events like that, I never saw the paper again. And it was published uh, uh, at Fitzroy Letters. They received it June 1st, 1964. Now, understanding this error led to an astonishing conclusion. The conclusion was simply that the conditions always assumed to be self-evident in proving this so-called nambu goldstone theorem that said broken symmetries always have a massless particle. Those assumptions did not hold for electromagnetism or similar theories. In fact, the ones, the theories we now are mostly interested in, and even then we were mostly interested in. So the theorem that everyone was bound by, the poison and the jam, turned out to be a very weak poison. Uh, the theorem was irrelevant to our universe. That was really, so this wrong paper had an interesting outcome. Now, as an amusing fact, quite a bit later, a few months later, Peter Higgs published a paper in Physics Letters. And that paper makes the same subtle error, and, but it shows the power of a, of a really subtle error. He comes to a different conclusion than I did. Now, the conclusion that he comes to is actually the one that now everyone likes, but there was zero justification for it in this paper. But that paper has thousands of citations. Uh, and just now, people are beginning to admit that paper is wrong. It took 50 years. Uh, anyway, immediately after I found that error, I realized that there was another solution to electromagnetism, uh, which is characterized by being, spont uh, have, uh, by being spontaneously symmetry broken, and which absolutely not only isn't required to have a zero mass photon, zero mass photon. It doesn't have one. There's no zero mass particle, physical particle whatsoever associated with this solution. So Hagen, Kibble, who I mentioned in the earlier slide, was one of the young faculty at Imperial College. And I put all these ideas together and wrote a paper making these obser the observations that I've just explained to you. Of course, it was very mathematical, and I've skipped over all that as you won't sure are very thankful for. And, and, and the mathematics is fairly tricky still. Okay? And basically, uh, uh, this solution corresponds to something that's like a new phase. For example, water has various phases, right? Liquid, ice and steam. And the behavior of this new solution is entirely different from anything we had ever seen from electromagnetism before. In fact, as I mentioned, the massless photon is gone. There's no massless photon. It's replaced by a spin one, one particle like the photon, but it has non-zero mass. In fact, it behave, would behave, <coughs> does behave very much like the Z or W gauge bosons I mentioned when I showed you the table at the beginning of this talk. Part of the charge scalar field that was in this theory you know, we had something, we had another field representing that had to be put in for various reasons, uh, help make this particle. And when it helped make this particle, there was a lonely, you know, uh, not a, a separated particle left over. It was a spin zero scalar particle with no charge, so everything got rearranged. And that particle, is now what's called the God particle, or the Higgs boson. And what we had done is we had generated mass through the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking, and that was something quite new. Okay. We had done this by late April of 1964. Remember, I mean, did, in earlier April, I'd done this wrong paper, and it's all the air. We didn't submit it to much late, or much later. Why did we delay? Not hard to guess, right? We were all young men, and I was particularly worried. Three strikes and you can easily be out in physics. And, and I thought, I do not dare do another long paper on this. And we were very afraid that we were wrong, because I had learned the very hard way that this was an absolutely treacherous problem. Here, after having seen the famous picture of Einstein, Here's Kibble on the left and myself, hoping we could find inspiration 
by emulating things. It didn't work. Uh, but we applied every test we could think of to this work, and, find, and it all passed, and finally we decided that we, were, that we would publish it. And literally, as it was in, it was in the envelope going off to be published, and some related work in preprint form, or pre-publication form, arrived by Inglet, Galton, Higgs, and, and these are now very famous papers. And we read these papers, and they certainly address essentially the same problem, and there were indeed a lot of cleverness and brilliance in them, but they succumbed to traps that we had avoided and knew about, and we wrote them off. And we, we still think that in non-trivial ways, these papers are actually wrong. Nevertheless, as I say, they're brilliant, they're brilliant pieces of work. Okay. Now, we did expect from our previous experience we were going to have trouble convincing the physics community that this made sense. Uh, that was an understatement. Mostly people were polite when they told me how long this was. Uh, I gave a talk in Munich in July of 1965 at a conference held in the honor of Werner Heisenberg, the founder of quantum mechanics and certainly one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century. And he was polite enough to do it in private, but he made it very clear that he was not uncertain about our work. Remember, he had an uncertainty principle. The work he wasn't uncertain about, he told me that it was junk. Uh, I became quite scared again. Uh, now, Julian Schwinger, the man who I had said in my thesis was, defense was wrong, was also at this conference. And we had been, he wasn't my advisor, obviously, as I said, but we'd been on pretty good terms, at least until my thesis. I didn't talk to him immediately afterwards. And he'd just bought, uh, he'd just bought a very fancy new car that, uh, that he, cost probably most or all the Nobel Prize money that he got later uh, that year. And he didn't say a thing about my talk. He just ran into me and says, Jerry, you've got to come for a ride in my new car. And as we're walking out of the place where the conference was given, Mrs. Teller, so many of you will remember Edward Teller, the so-called father of the hydrogen bomb, who was a very smart and very scary man, uh, uh, his wife, who was also very smart and scary, uh, <laughs> came up to us and said, I'm, you're going for a ride in your new car, Julian? I'm coming with you. So this car was essentially a two-seater. It had an imagination seat in the rear. So I was stuffed into the rear, practically cheek to cheek, the Schwinger who was driving this thing. He drove it. It had a manual transmission, which was absolutely required in the sports car at that time. He drove it with great skill. And Edward Teller's wife watched him doing this and said, you know, Julian, in the United States, when we spend this much money for a car, it has an automatic transmission. <laughs> and here, I don't have a picture of the car, unfortunately, but here he is. So the conclusion you can make from these car pictures I've shown you so far is that American theorists often like very, at least at that time, often liked impractical uh, vehicles. Now, the reason for that uh, was twofold. We liked the mechanics, but also uh, uh, in many of our cases, for example, myself and Hagen, we came from the Midwest and the car was liberation, and a fast car was even greater liberation. Uh, all right, on Hagen's recommendation, Robert Marshak, another important personage of the 20th century, gave me a postdoctoral job at the University of Rochester, and he told me I had to stop working on um, the symmetry breaking ideas. And so I went off to work on another on an idea of Steven Weinberg's. And while I was working on that idea, it turned out that Steven Weinberg was working on the Grolichate and Kibble work. Uh, but that new work got me a job at Brown University, and where I've been since after the 1967 68. And um, as I mentioned before, he and Salon, Weinberg and Salon, along with Glashow, uh, who did preliminary work, discovered the unified theory of weak and electromagnetism. And this model is the cornerstone of modern particle physics and essential for this model 
is a work that I just outlined for you. So this led to decades of research and building this vast machine that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. And uh, we uh, got some recognition for this. Uh, this was we, uh, the six of us involved got the Sakurai Prize in 2010. We're now, as you can see, no longer young men. On the left is Tom Kibble, then followed by myself, Dick Hagen, uh, uh, Englert, and Robert Brown, who unfortunately died before the discovery of the Higgs boson was made. Now, let me just talk for a minute about the machine. Okay. LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, was, is in Geneva, Switzerland. It's a used thing. The, now, this is an outline of where essential uh, uh, cracks of the machine lie, where the various inj injection paths and the rings lie. Of course, the machine itself is far underground. You don't want to give the cows walking in the grassy areas radiation poison, let alone the people. The machine is way is well done down, and the circumference of this machine is 27 kilometers. It's huge. Now, uh, so we built, to find this particle, the world's largest scientific interest instrument, the LHC. It hit, bangs protons together at high energy. It's down now to do modification, so it will bang them together at even higher energies. Uh, it turns out a Higgs boson is roughly created once every two billion collisions of protons hitting protons. Here's a typical process. Uh, you measure the decay of the H, the Higgs boson, into two photons. And we built inside this thing our detectors to detect these particles. And these detectors are as big as cathedrals. They're enormous. This is a picture of the inside of the actual detector. You can see the levels on the side. You can see the various floors with instrumentations and a tool case, which gives you some idea of the scale uh, of this thing. Now, when a Higgs boson, when a Higgs boson, it doesn't do that. But, but when a Higgs boson uh, is created, it immediately decays into a variety of things. Uh, a common one indicated above is two photons. And the detector measures the energies of these photons. And you can compute the mass of the particle comes from by using a famous old formula in the MC scale. Now, it was announced the color comes again. You also have to understand the only time, this is a more recent picture, but in the old days, the only time that cameras ever came out when there was a new car uh, or a new girlfriend or a wedding. <laughs> and and uh, this is, okay, this is uh, taken on the way to, uh, on our way, Hagen and myself, on the way to CERN for an announce, the announcement made on July 4th. Now, we were told to go to CERN by our experimentalists. We said, well, has the particle been discovered? And they said, we don't know, but there's going to be an important meeting, and by then we'll finish the analysis and we'll find out. <laughs> but we think you should probably go. And of course, we both said, no, it's the 4th of July. We're going to do more interesting things and go to hear someone say they haven't discovered something. And then the experimentalist said, you will go. <laughs> and you don't argue with experimentalists, it turns out. You have to be very tough and very determined to be able to do this incredibly difficult work. All right. So we did discover before we hit the ocean that the car wasn't going to cut it, so we did have to take a plane. Uh, here I am with Ulrich Hines standing next to me at a, a depiction of the actual uh, compact muon solenoid. Thank you. Can you hear me through this? And uh, they tried to tell me that this was a real thing. It didn't take me more than a millisecond to realize that was not so. But you know, they think the theorists are gullible, mostly they're right. All right, to give you some idea, of, again, of the scale, there's that life-size depiction, one-to-one -one scale, 
and there's 20% of the compact muon solenoid collaboration of the physicists, one fifth of the physicists who are currently work, working on that experiment. Now, when we got to CERN, there was this big line outside the auditorium. Turns out they were very little auditorium, relatively speaking. And we stood in back of this line for a while, realized that we weren't going to get in, and decided maybe we could find a way to sneak in. And then we walked up to the door. They looked at Hagen, and they let him in. They challenged me. <laughs> but eventually, I got in. And um, here is the auditorium. And the announcement has just been made that with high probability, they have discovered a particle. And it's a new boson with a mass of 125 GeV. It's 125 times roughly the mass of a proton. And the accuracy of that discovery was pretty good then. It's much better now. And uh, just this happens to be from the ACLIS, not the CMS collaboration. Just gives you a list of the many countries involved in, in this experiment. It's from all over, all over the world. There was wild applause at this. I uh, made Sports Illustrated by my quote saying at this meeting that, wow, this is like a football game. I've never seen physicists get so excited. So <laughs> much to the jealousy of, of my brother-in-laws who are serious sports fans. I think I once was to a real football game. Uh, anyway, is this the boson? Probably now, after the recent uh, announcements, almost certainly. I believe that the boson, the Higgs boson, has been found, that the standard model is complete. After the presentations, Hagen was very happy about this. I was even happier. Here I'm making the sports crowd comment. And uh, the Horror Times and another experimentalist, we enjoyed a small, quiet dinner later on at a very, very good Vistro. Now, what does this all mean? Okay. Again, I've called on him frequently, but he's a very wise man. Uh, uh, in the New York Times, July 13th, Stephen Weinberg said, let me read to you this. It's a very important statement. On a longer time scale, the advance of technology will reflect the coherent picture of nature which we are now assembling. At the end of the 19th century, physicists in England were exploring the properties of electric currents passing through a near vacuum. Although this was pure science, it led to our knowledge of the electron without which a large part of today's technology would be impossible. That these physicists had limited themselves to the work of obvious practical importance, they would have been discovering the behavior of steam boilers. A more modest but also appropriate statement made by Robert Wright in The Atlantic was. So as for the question of what this Higgs boson thing ultimately means, it means we should all try to have some intellectual humility because the thing we're using to try to understand the world, the human brain is a pretty crude instrument. Or should I say, that's what I think the Higgs boson means. Finally, I want to say that these wonderful experiments covering a half century of time in formulation and execution uh, have, have made a major a discovery, which I'm sure will become very important, probably in a hundred years. Uh, and I feel fortunate to have had the luck, the thrills, and the considerable angst, as you can get some feeling for what I said, of working on an understanding and predicting this particle. Now, this work was driven by pure curiosity. We had no idea we were doing anything other than very interesting mathematics that might, by some long shot, have to do something with physics. We had no anticipation that this would affect the gross national uh, product, nor be useful for homeland security. We did it because we were curious. And then the government was very happy and very generous to support us.
and indeed to even support Imperial College in London for this endeavor. And it was a great luxury. And I believe, unless everything collapses and we become other heathen, that this is the beginning of a new age in physics and also in particle physics. Thank you for your attention.